All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Eller. Welcome to Coffee with Community Services. Today is November 1st. If we can believe it. I am excited for this fall weather, so I hope you all are enjoying it as well. Um, John Decker is off today, um, so uh, he will return in the future. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with introductions um, as we normally do, so I can let you know who is here with our Ulta team. So uh, good morning, Michelle Duchesne, uh, Community Services Manager overseeing our adult and residential services. Uh, good morning to Helen Neary, also a Community Services Manager seeing our um, clinical and children's services. Um, good morning to Odelia, Community Services Specialist, overseeing some of our residential and SLS. Um, good morning, Christine. Christine Hobbs is one of our vendor coordinators. And good morning to Alejandra. Um, she is also a Community Services Specialist. Good morning, Alicia. Alicia is one of our HCBS Specialists. Good morning. And I also see Zach. Good morning, Zach. Zach is John's Executive Assistant. Uh, good morning to Mason. Mason's one of our newest Community Services Specialists in Helen's unit. Um, good morning, Carly, our employment service um, employment specialist. And I also see that we have Marty on from our HCBS team, quality assurance team. Good morning to Michael, our deaf of heart of hearing specialist. We will we will hear for him today, as always, with his good updates. Um, and we got Scott Barr, our uh, our other uh, community services manager who oversees our QA and HCBS. Uh, good morning, Jason. Jason is a lead community services specialist. And uh, good morning, Rhonda Phillips is our, our housing specialist. Good morning. I see that Cindy Lay is on with our uh, client services manager. We're seeing an adult unit. Good morning to Toby. Toby is our intensive case management unit. Good morning, Toby, uh, the manager over there. And I see that Beverly and um, Hubert are both on from community services. Hubert's going to share some items with us today as well. Good morning, Jennifer Bloom, our associate client director. And I see that we also have Chris is on from um, Community Services, our QA department, and uh, Jolana. Good morning, Jolana, Community Services. And I see that Camelia Houston is on, our Director of Intake and Clinical Services. Good morning. Um, good morning, Aida. She's one of our service coordinators out in our, um, our uh, Roseville office. And let's see, we have Linda White. Good morning, Linda. Linda is my vendor coordinator in our specialized services unit. Um, good morning to Jaslyn. She's on Helen's team in community services. And I also see that Christy Schaefer is on. She's one of my uh, CPP resource developers. Good morning, folks. So um, to let you know a little bit about our agenda today, we're going to have Michael share uh, the sign of the week in Deaf Culture 101. He also has some event updates that he participated in. So we'll have him share that. Um, we have a vendor spotlight. I do just want to check, is there a, a Joe Lee from 24-7 All Staff on yet? Not yet. Okay, so we'll watch out for 24-7 for All Staffing so that we can um, we can see if they'll be able to share today. Hubert's going to go over uh, the new DDS Emergency Preparedness Fall Bulletin. We also have Jason. There's a new coordinated family supports directive that Jason is going to go over for us. Um, Jennifer Bloom or I will share the upcoming NCI public meetings that will be happening. Scott's got some fun HCBS updates for us. Um, Carly's going to let us know about the day and employment vendor fair that's coming up next week. Um, and then we also have Michelle's going to provide us updates on the service provider directory. We did receive um, the second DDS rate reform implementation directive just this week. So we'll go over that. And um, and then some events that we have coming up. So I will first turn it over to Michael for our uh, Deaf Culture 101 and sign of the week. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you, Michael, so that all folks can see it easily. Okay, hello, good morning. It feels weird. I, I think I've missed two sessions um, so far. Um, so, but now I'm here. Uh, my name is um, Michael. I believe um, Michelle was able to share my videos and um, the information the past couple weeks. So now we're gonna talk about some of the celebrations that are coming up this weekend. Um, specifically Day of the Dead. There's three different signs. Um, they're gonna, we're gonna do a simple version. If you wanna learn more in depth vocabulary, I'll be able to send you a link. Um, it's a woman from Mexico. She has a storybook. I really encourage you to watch her video. Um, it does have um, actual verbal English as well as the signing. 
You could share it with your staff, with your clients, um, anyone who's deaf and hard of hearing in the community, go ahead and share that link. Okay, ready for the signs? We have three today. Our first one is dead day. Then it's family and friends. And then the third one is pray. Okay, so for day of the dead, so first you're gonna do day, it's so your pointer finger, really like a D. And that's your dominant hand and it's gonna go down onto your non-dominant arm and then dead. So day, dead. Some deaf and hard of hearing people will say day of the dead. I just do day dead. But in Mexico, they have a unique sign that I'm unfamiliar with, but they do have their own sign for it as well. Okay, the next one is family. So two Fs, they're gonna go in a circle and that's family. And then friends. And it, it can be a challenging sign for friends. So you have two index fingers, you're going to turn them into Xs. Then you're gonna join them together one way, flip them around and join them together again. So friends, all right, we'll do that again. So family and friend. Okay, next is pray. And typically we'll, we will recognize this as, as prayer hands. Okay, I shared two links. One is my signs of the week, and then the second one is that um, story about um, Day of the Dead. All right. Okay, so now Deaf Culture 101. We're gonna talk about a specific word. It's C-O-D-A. C is child, O is of, D is deaf, and A is adult. Or you might see K-O-D-A, kid of deaf adult. So CODA. What that means is deaf parents who give birth to a hearing child. 90% of deaf parents have hearing children and they will be called CODAs, either C-O-D-A or K-O-D-A. So there's a, they have a lot of strengths. They're bilingual. So CODAs will grow up being fluent in both American Sign Language and English. Many are very skilled with communication. But again, I wanna let you know, CODAs are not all the same. But oftentimes, CODAs will have that bilingual communication. Another thing is cultural awareness. They understand deaf culture and the hearing world at the same time. And that will help them to almost act as a bridge between the two. So they might see what their parents struggle with in the hearing world. And then they see how the hearing world may not know how to interact with deaf culture. So CODAs might internally feel a responsibility to advocate and bridge that gap. Another strength is having a very strong family bond. They share experiences with deaf culture and they really have that connection with their family. There's also some struggles as well. So growing up with deaf parents and um, growing up in that lifestyle can be different. Sometimes there'll be role confusion. The parents sign, sometimes the children will have siblings or that are hearing, or maybe one parent is hearing and one is deaf. One, someone may sign to them and then the next person speaks to them and that can be very confusing trying to transition between those languages in one family. Another thing could be an identity struggle. They might feel like they're between worlds. They have the deaf world and the hearing world and not sure they don't fully identify with the deaf world and they don't fully identify with the hearing world. So that can be a challenge. So that's why in America they have um, CODA conferences, CODA camps, um, different events where they can feel 
like they're with people who have shared experience and have commonalities. Um, there might be some social challenges. Sometimes um, they might have a struggle with hearing peers. Maybe they already feel ingrained in the deaf culture. Um, like for example, with eye contact, they're so used to maintaining eye contact and a lot of hearing individuals will feel uncomfortable or it might be different manners in the hearing world compared to deaf culture like they're used to. They might also feel pressure to fit in, trying to balance the expectations with deaf and hearing friends. A reminder for you, if you interact with deaf parents who have co a CODA, they have a child um, that is hearing, please don't ask them to interpret for their deaf parents. Growing up, many CODAs have some scars, some trauma from that. There can be a lot of frustration. They're very young. They might not know the vocabulary and they've been asked to interpret for their families. And so make sure you hire a qualified professional interpreter. Children should not be used as interpreters, even if they are fluent and are bilingual. Couple fun facts. Many CODAs are really able to advocate for the deaf community and raise awareness and spread the word about deaf culture. Oftentimes hearing people may not understand um, a deaf presentation or any commentary and Dakota has an opportunity to share more. CODAs also typically have diverse careers because they know sign language, they can work in fields like social work, education for deaf and hard of hearing students. Be, they might become interpreters. Um, they have shared humor. They have similar experiences to many individuals. CODAs might not have to worry about sneaking out of the house. They don't have to be quiet because they have deaf parents. They can turn on the car engine and just drive away and, and not have to worry about their parents hearing them. So they have that shared humor. Also, CODAs have that beautiful connection to deaf history. They often can really understand the history and the issues for deaf individuals, and they're really advocates for the deaf community. So those children of deaf adults or kids of deaf adults, they really have a huge heart for the deaf community and they're wonderful advocates. Okay, perfect, thank you. So now I wanted to provide an update on what I've been doing so far. So this path, oh, should we switch interpreters? Okay. We'll be switching interpreters. So last weekend, I had gone to a conference, um, and it's a Cal educational conference. Cal Ed is um, hosted for the whole state of California, and it's for um, based on focusing on deaf and hard of hearing students and all um, those who are educators, uh, hearing and deaf educators who specifically w work within the deaf um, and hard of hearing community and educate. And parents will come to these conferences that have deaf children, um, audiologists, speech therapists, um, regional center representatives will come to this conference and uh, join in unity. And there's a lot of workshops um, on various topics on this and issues that arise. And the focus is really on deaf and hard of hearing students and their rights and the rights that they have within the school system. And, you know, a lot of us will bring up issues that we struggle with in um, the system of education or deaf and hard of hearing teachers, you know, feel like that they struggle with standing up for students and their rights, you know, just because, you know, sometimes they feel like they can't say anything and they want to know rights and they want to do things in the appropriate manner, you know, so, and it really comes down to, the, you know, and the parents and the parents being educating, educated and knowing and what's in, you know, important is that we advocate the parents and educate them because a lot of times parents don't know what to do with their deaf child in education and how that works, especially if it's just a hearing uh, family. And so it's it's important to educate and, and know the child's rights as parents and educate others. And there is a law that's called AB 1938, and that is an established law that uh, children have rights um, in education that their needs are met. 
and that schools uh, cannot neglect those needs that these uh, children have specifically. So there's AB 1938, and that's been established to protect the rights of deaf and hard of hearing kids. And so that law has been set. So we, because we have fought for deaf and hard of hearing students and their rights and equal access in education. There are different workshops and um, lectures and such being held. There's panels that are that are held during these conferences. There's deaf and hard of hearing students that are on the panel. They would typically put five on the panel and they share their experiences as a deaf individual, deaf being in education and their experiences and what they've seen. And it's really empowering and it's powerful for us to see and learn from that. And it, it helps us to see how we can improve it within the educational system. And also, you know, we really need to see more deaf and hard of hearing um, adults and individuals to be involved in the system to, to so these kids have deaf role models. And we just, you know, we feel like with the regional center, we've we've been talking and we just really need more advocates of, you know, deaf who are that can advocate and help with these, you know, deaf and hard of hearing children and be involved in the IEP pro process to advocate for those deaf children within that process. So because a lot of go into these IEP meetings, not understanding what their rights are or what they can do. And they they just don't get what an IEP is for. And so it's important that we have deaf uh, role models within and that are involved in this. So these workshops at Cal Ed are, are really, um, we learn quite a bit. Um, there's speech therapists, audiologists, parents. We just all sit and discuss and we learn from each other at this conference. Um, also last Tuesday, I had gone to a there is a deaf education fair and there was a resource booth that I had set up there. And so there were kids that, you know, attended this, it was at a school and it was like, and kids were dressed up for Halloween and the booths um, had different activities and games there. And so the activity that I had hosted was I did sticker, I had stickers and um, I had four different stickers. There was like a black cat, a, a skeleton with sunglasses and then a pumpkin and then a ghost. And so what I did, I had laid those out and I had asked them which, you know, which sticker they preferred or liked. And, and I had to have them, um, it's kind of doing the flipping the matching memory game. And so they, if they got what they, they matched what they wanted, they, they want a sticker. So it was just a motivation behind that. So I had a lot of parents come up to my booth, ask questions. There are some parents that had just moved into the area and didn't know much about, you know, our services. So I explained to them what Alta Regional Center does. And some of the parents shared concerns that they had with me. And um, I just was able to work and um, help and, you know, network with people and, you know, people were just excited to be able to meet a deaf and hard of hearing individual and people are just noticing there's a lack of not enough deaf adults in the community and being out there. So there was, there was one individual that is within this meeting in coffee and community that had came up to me and said, oh yeah, I've seen you before. And I was trying to figure out who it was. And I realized, oh my gosh, you're in the coffee and community meeting. So I was just delighted to, you know, that I was approached and, you know, so just thank you for being um, attentive to this and I appreciate it. Is um, Do you guys have any questions or comments or anything that you would like to ask before we end? None? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. It's great to hear about that. I'm glad you had a good time at the event. Sounds like a good turnout. All right, folks. So I am going to... I don't see Jolie on yet for Spotlight, Jordan. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and move on. If if um, Jason's going to keep tabs to see if if our vendor Spotlight pops on, if not, we'll get them scheduled for another day. So um, thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Hubert, who has some emergency preparedness. He's our emergency response coordinator. So he's going to share some resources with us for the fall. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone had a safe and fun Halloween last mm -hmm. night. Um, I'm wondering if anyone could see my screen here. Not yet. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Perfect. It's coming up. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so very brief um, blurb here today, but uh, DDS just came out with their fall safety bulletin, um, which gives you a bunch of resources 
on different things that we've been up to um, and how to stay safe during this fall season, right? So um, I'm not sure if you remember, but last week um, or a couple of weeks ago, we had a great the Great Shakeout Reminder, which is a global um, earthquake drill um, that everyone took part, uh, partook in at Alta. Uh, we had some Halloween safety tips included in here. So hopefully um, all of these kind of look familiar with if you went trick-or-treating last night with your young ones or if you were out and about last night. Um, there's a section on sensory-friendly Halloween activities um, and you can go to myautism.org to access those. <clears throat> Daylight savings is on November 3rd. So your clocks will get set back one hour. Um, make sure to test your smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detector detectors and make sure the batteries are fresh. Uh, if you have fire extinguishers at home, check to see if they are still charged. Pay attention uh, to cars when crossing the street uh, in the evening because it gets darker earlier. <clears throat> So flu season preparation, right? So as we enter the holiday season uh, and begin to spend more time with connecting with family and friends, it's important to consider our chances of encountering viruses like flu and the COVID-19. Uh, to avoid the possibility of missing important gatherings due to respiratory illness this winter, consider these tips here, right? Avoid close contact with people who are sick, stay home when you are sick, cover your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze, Wash your hands often with soap. Avoid touching your ears, nose, and mouth. Let fresh air into your home and then check with your uh, doctor or primary care physician about getting the flu shot. <clears throat> In the chat here, um, after I'm done with my presentation, I'll kind of uh, give you guys a link um, on how to schedule a vaccine appointment if you choose to get one. <clears throat> uh, lastly, we have online safety shopping, online sh shopping safety. Um, so as the holiday season approaches, right, everyone's going to be, um, shopping more online, um, if you choose not to go in person for Black Friday shopping. Um, so some ways to stay safe, uh, while you snag those deals is just by following some of these steps, right? Um, along with that, along with the steps listed here, we want to make sure that we stick to trusted websites and double check URLs to avoid lookalike scams, um, enable multi-factor authentic authentication on accounts to add an extra layer of security, and avoid public Wi-Fi when making pur purchases. If you're using online marketplaces, read reviews carefully and never share sensitive information outside of the platform. Um, here on the bottom, we can access um, you know, supplemental resources. And if you want to figure out a way on how to access this entire document um, in various languages, you can go to Alta's website, um, Emergency Preparedness webpage. So how to access that is from our homepage. <clears throat> you just go to the top right-hand corner on menu. Under Clients and Families, you'll go down to Resources. Click on that. <clears throat> and you can go all the way to, um, on the left-hand side of the page, to Emergency Preparedness. Um, it'll be under this first section here, Preparing for the Fall Season. Uh, we've also updated this webpage to include other ways on how you can stay safe during cold weather, um, some warming center resources, um, and this will be updated as we slowly enter into the winter season, so stay tuned for that. Um, other than that, that's all I have for you guys today, so thank you. Thank you so much, Hubert. Would you mind putting that link to our website, just so quick access in the chat for folks? That'd be perfect. Thank you so gotcha. much for sharing those resources. All right. Um, so next, we're going to let Jason share the new directive about coordinated family supports. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone had a great Halloween and happy first day of November. Um, so the uh, coordinated family supports, which is service code 076, um, the department released a letter on October 21st with some updates to the program. Um, which I'll go over. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to let everyone know that we currently have seven providers right now. So in about a year and a half's time, we've um, brought on seven providers. We have two that are currently going through accounting for processing right now. And we have two that are currently working on their um, program designs right now. So we're slowly but surely um, gaining more providers and um but when i'm done with my presentation i'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat so if you're interested to learn more about this wonderful program 
I'm happy to schedule a meeting. We can talk about it. We can talk about the regulations, the rate and all that good stuff. So anyway, um, so the letter that came out, um, it follows the January 27th, 2023 letter, as well as the March 6th, 2023 letter. And it's um, some updates on the Coordinated Family Supports Pilot Program. Um, so it's gonna, the letter went over some um, directions as far as um, providers that are seeking exceptions to the minimum qualifications. Um, also changes to both the consumer family satisfaction tool um, and, and as well as the regional center quarterly reporting. Um, also, uh, there's a few updates on uh, the vendor implementation incentive payment reporting requirements. Um, so first of all, um, so coordinated family uh, support vendors seeking exceptions to the minimum qualifications. So the original letter that went out in January said that um, coordinated family support service description and rates section refers to the process for coordinated family supports vendors requesting an exception to the minimum qualifications. Um, so this letter is just basically just kind of being more specific as far as for clarifying that if a CFS vendor receives a denial to an exception um, request and chooses to appeal that denial, the coordinated family supports vendor is to follow the vendorization appeal process. Um, and that's something that your assigned specialist, whoever that may be, whether it be me or a different specialist, will guide you through and help you um, in as far as navigating the appeal process for that. Um, the consumer uh, family satisfaction tool. So this is still a piloted program. So the department is still wanting to know, you know, what people's thoughts are about this program. Um, the department is going to be reaching out directly to the individuals and their families as far as with that satisfaction survey um, and, you know, possibly with some additional questions too. So it's not going to be um, reliant on the regional center or the provider as far as those um, satisfaction surveys go. Um, originally, the regional center uh, was required to submit quarterly reports directly to the department as far as, you know, gaining new providers, where the need is, and so forth. Um, so they did away with that for now, but they did say that they may be reaching out to regional centers just to get additional information in the future if need be. So our record, quarterly reporting tool is no longer required. However, providers quarterly reporting to the service coordinator is still required. So it is a quarterly track service. So you guys are provided to submit those quarterly reports to the assigned service coordinator. Um, and then for the implementation of the incentive payment reporting requirements. So there is an incentive uh, payment um, program going on with the service right now, which I know we've talked about in some previous copy with community services, where um, there's a, a quarterly reporting tool on DDS's website for our providers to submit quarterly reports directly to Department of Developmental Services. And then the department will send us a, a spreadsheet as far as what providers have submitted their quarterly reports. And then we add an 11% increase to your hourly rate of pay from that. So um, the updates with that is that uh, the March 6, 2024 letter provided information regarding the Coordinated Family Supports uh, Implementation Incentive Payment. Um, so Coordinated Family Supports vendors must submit a completed standard report regarding the implementation of Coordinated Family Supports services by the end of the month following the month the payment uh, was received. The questions on the reporting tool have been updated. This is the new part, um, which include more pertinent measures regarding recruitment, training, demographics, process timelines, and other topics. The department will provide an updated link for this reporting tool to each regional center's primary and secondary points of contact. The regional centers must provide that updated link to the CFS vendors beginning in December 2020, I'm sorry, to vendors within 14 days of this letter. Uh, and coordinated family supports providers must begin utilizing this new link at the beginning of December 2024 uh, for payment received in November of 2024 and ongoing. 
At this time right now, um, I have not received, none of us have received the link yet from DDS for that. I have reached out directly to their CFS inbox uh, requesting that link. So once I do receive that link, I will be sending it to all of our current providers as well as our new oncoming providers. Um, and then if you guys have any direct questions to the Department on Coordinated Family Supports, um, I'll go ahead and put that in uh, that email inbox um, in the chat and um, you guys will be able to, you know, reach out to them directly. You can always go through myself as well, too. So I'll go ahead and put my email address and I will also put in the Coordinated Family Supports at DDS email address. Thank you so much, Jason. Welcome. Um, does anybody have any questions for the for the chat here? Like Jason said, obviously you can reach out to him directly. Um, but that's great too that to hear that we have seven folks on board for, as vendored, right? And some more in progress too, Jason. So that's exciting. Um, any questions, folks? I don't see anything in the chat. All right. So next we will have Scott give us a HCBS update. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, I suppose. You know, it's been a while since we've reported on HCBS because in uh, August, we completed our first wave or first phase of uh, assessments and it was 100% complete. All of the uh, remediation plans and, and plans to come up to speed have been completed. And so we've uh, been enjoying some time and just kind of wrapping some things up, getting things reported, reported reports wrapped up. And I wanted to kind of bring you up to speed on what's been happening in the last couple of months and where we're going with HCBS. And so uh, to start, I will say that in September, there was a meeting to discuss the uh, standardization of a tool that will be used for evaluations going forward. Um, there is a process that is being engaged and we found out a little bit more about that in October, um, essentially that DDS is gathering all of our different HCBS assessment tools from the 21 different regional centers, and they're going to come up with a, a, and develop a standardized tool for us to use going forward. Now, currently, what's happening is Futures Explored still has a, um, an ongoing grant through HCBS to assist with um, programs that have been vendored after March of 2020. Now, the benchmark there of March of 2020 is that all programs that were uh, vendored after that date included HCBS components in their program designs. And so they were initially thought to be compliant, and now we're just going to be going back through and, and assessing those. But Futures Explored has a list of 50 plus providers um, that were vendored after March 2020, and they're in the process of meeting with those scheduling meetings with them and um, preparing them for on-site evaluations that are to come. So this, we hope, should increase the number of initially compliant vendors in our area, which we had a pretty high percentage during the, the first phase. And so we're looking forward to having this be a, a smooth process with everyone where everybody gets their questions answered and it's, uh, it's smooth. Part two of HCBS that I know everybody is waiting to hear on is, is grant related. And so we expect that those grants are going to be announced, the amounts that are gonna be uh, sent out to each different regional center in the next month. You should expect as a vendor to receive an email from us, from ACRC that talks about um, you know, what, what numbers are available, what's being made available to the regional center for this next uh, year. And so it's most important that you have updated email addresses in our system. Um, if not for the provider directory that we've been gathering and working towards uh, for the last year, um, but for this purpose as well. And so feel free to reach out to your assigned CSS specialists, make sure that we've got your updated contact information so that you can receive information when those get, grants get released. And we're expecting the same kind of year as last year. So um, that was $862,000. Uh, 
that we can distribute amongst all of these different vendors um, for HCBS related projects. And that's all I got for today. Thank you for listening. That's exciting. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for um for folks on that? I did see something popped up in the chat. Is that related to this? Let me see what that says. Hold on. I, I do have one more thing. Perfect. Mm -hmm. You have one more thing. Uh, the assessment tool. For those of you that are curious, we've got it on our website. And I'm going to pop that into the chat right now as well. And uh, we can navigate to that quickly if you want to see what that looks like. Let me just share my sure. screen quick. Not as good as Hubert, but um, this is our this is our page, cool. and essentially you can navigate there also through that that menu button. Um, you're going to want to select service providers, and then go down to the CMS final rule in HCBS, and there is where you have the HCBS provider assessments. There's a link here to that uh, review document right here. So if you want, this is part of our transparency. You can look through this and see exactly what it is that we're reviewing, which regulations they're attached to. And uh, this is accessible to anybody that can view our website. And that's all I've got. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. No, that's super, that's that's very um, helpful. So folks know where to find that. Um, and then thank you, Kylie put the, the HCVS email in the chat. So if you guys have any questions, thank you for that, Kylie. And um, I also see that Helen took care of our question. Thank you, Helen, for answering that in the chat. But did, any other questions for Scott? All right. Thank you so much, Scott. Glad to hear it's going well, right? That's that's a that's a plus. Um, and so next, I'm actually going to uh, Michelle Johnson's going to share some about the national core indicator meetings that we have coming up at our board meeting. I'm going to go ahead and share the flyer for you, Michelle, so that folks can see our flyer here. All right, thank you, Jordan. Yes, um, on, no on November 21st from 4 to 6 p.m., we will present our national core indicator data. Uh, for the adult in-person survey. And we will also present our year-end performance contract that provides data and measures on topics that include where clients live, our compliance with the Department of Developmental Services standards, and how well we're doing at getting clients um, to be employed and how well we're doing at reducing disparities and improving equity. Um, so registration is required for this meeting. Um, the survey data, as well as the year end performance data is posted on our website. Um, following the meeting on November 21st, within 60 days of that meeting, we, um, Jen Bloom and I have a report to write to the department. Um, and so we want your feedback and we need it by December 5th um, in order to incorporate that into the report that we write to DDS. Um, and again, so this meeting will take place on the 21st from four to six, Spanish and ASL will be provided, um, and additional languages are available when they're requested at least one week in advance of the meeting. So, um, we hope to see you there and we are sharing broadly and widely to our entire community of clients, um, families, community members, vendors, et cetera. Perfect. And I put the link to um, the flyer in the chat so that people can e easily register from that if they would like to. And then it's also on our, our website. So thank Perfect. you, Jordan. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Michelle. Okay. And now we're going to pass it over to Carly, our employment specialist. She's got some updates for us. I made you a co-host in case you need to share anything. Carly. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I'm just going to do a quick plug here for the day and employment vendor fair we have coming up on November 5th. Um, I will let everyone know at this point we are um, fully booked. The um, survey, um, the registration survey is closed. Um, however, we have had um, a couple of um, cancellations. So if you didn't get a chance to register, 
um, and you really want to register, feel free to reach out to me um, and we can see if we can make that work. Um, I'm sure, you know, we always have some last minute cancellations. Um, we already have had a couple this morning. I'm sure we'll have <laughs> one or two more uh, Monday or Tuesday. So if you really want to attend and you didn't get a chance to register, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but certainly um, this is a great event for vendors to come um, and set up a table, connect with community services staff and case management. So um, any case management that is on here, um, I encourage you to um, stop by and connect with um, the vendors that we have um, attending the event uh, next Tuesday. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carly. And how many people did you say we had signed up already? How many vendors? Um, I think we have oh. about 32. That's excellent. That's great. That's great. So yeah, case management staff, come learn more about folks, right? It's nice to be able to ask the direct questions there, not just read a program design, right? So that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Carly, for setting that up for us. All right. So next we'll get into kind of some of the, the more rate study updates. We're going to have uh, Michelle give us an update on the service provider directory, just where we're at this week. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. So just to let everyone know, we did get notice that the provider directory is live. Um, we are receiving updates from our vendors on changes and confirmations. Um, is there anyone on that has gone through the process of logging in that can share just kind of how the process is going or how simple it is? Anyone willing to share? Nobody yet. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys are on there logging in. So we are receiving, um, and the reason I ask is, is that we are receiving some information that shows that there are changes. However, um, for an example, is a suite that was dropped, like a suite number. Um, however, when we ask the provider and confirm, they're advising that they did not want to change the suite number. So um, we are, be, based on that, we've sent some questions out to the department to kind of see um, Oh, it looks like there's some emails in there. So um, we are reaching out for confirmation and some clarification from the department. However, at this time, just to be sure that we aren't confirming um, changes that are not necessary, we are having specialists reach out um, as that goes through. So we've been advised it's gone live. I see some people saying they have not received an email. Um, I will find that information and send that bulletin in the um, chat for you guys. Um, and also they um, they extended the due date. So for the one-time stipend, it was originally the 8th. However, because of the process and because it took a little bit longer um, to get it to go live, it's been changed to November 29th. Um, so I will get that in the chat for you guys so you guys can review that. Um, again, if you have any other questions regarding this, um, we have an inbox. It's rate study. I'll put it in the in the chat. It's rate study questions at altaregional.org. And that will be the same um, email that you guys will utilize as Jordan shares the new directive. And we talk a little bit about um, the changes there. Right. And I do see, thank you, um, Andrea and um, Brandon for putting the information in the chat, right, that you haven't received your email yet. And then, um, Jay, I also see that you had um, received some information that DDS is having some IT issues with vendors worth multiple service codes, it sounds like. Yeah, they said it's a third party issue. The third party that they had contracted out to work, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, is having issues with getting the information over to DDS so they're aware that there's a problem and they're okay. the problem they're hoping uh, next week or so that they'll have it out to vendors as well. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. Any other questions on that, folks, or uh, discussion? All right, perfect. So then next, I'm going to actually share my screen because we have received the um, uh, second rate reform implementation directive from DDS. So that just came out on the 30th. Let me share my screen here. We'll give you the link as well. Um, so you guys can get it in the chat. Just one moment, please. Let me get this stuff set up here. Um, so this came out on the 30th. Um, all of our teams, Michelle and Helen and Scott and I, we were 
digesting this, some of this information yesterday. You know, we do still have some questions for DDS, so we'll be addressing that. But I do just want to kind of give you guys an overview so you guys are aware that this is here. We'll continue to discuss this, of course, at all the coffees, right, through through the next couple months and I'm sure into 2025 as well. Um, but they did provide some, you know, some additional helpful information. So we'll continue to get right directives as they, they figure out kind of each piece of this. So uh, this came out on the 31st. It's um, the rate reform. It's the second the second uh, directive they've sent out. Um, so the directive supplements the initial one that was issued by the department regarding the rate reform implementation. This letter provides information about special circumstances, including rates established through health and safety waivers, alternative service delivery, which we refer to as AB 637 waivers, and the process for addressing these existing services and new vendorizations that do not align with the updated service descriptions as written in the subsequent directives. So I've kind of highlighted some of the important dates for us as we roll through this. Regional centers must update rates under the current service codes by January 1st of 2025. The regional centers are going to have until March 31st of 2025 um, to input new service codes and rate based on the alignment of the service provider's actual services within the rate reform update service code description, right? So regional centers will then, uh, the case management side, are going to need to update the individual program plans or in individualized family service plans um, and ref authorizations to reflect the rate reform alignment no later than December 31st of 2025, right? So planning teams will have a year to ensure that this is all accurate within the IPPs specific to health and safety waivers and AB 637s. So the regional centers have department uh, approved waivers for rate adjustments using statutory processes for health and safety waivers. There's links to those if you're not familiar. And alternatives for service delivery commonly referred to as AB 637 waivers, which is all pursuant to Welfare and Institution Codes uh, 4669.2 and 4669.75. So the department will provide each regional center a list of the, their approved AB 637 waivers and um, health and safety waivers and instructions for reporting the determination of each provider vendorization. Regional centers must review all service providers vendorizations using these waivers to determine which updated service description, service code, and subcode combinations align with the services currently being delivered. If the services can be delivered in accordance with the rate reforms updated service description and they no longer need an AB 637 or health and safety waiver, the rate must be adjusted to the rate reform rate for the service. So basically how I equate that is that if you currently have a health and safety waiver and that rate is lower than the new rate study amount, we would issue you the rate study amount and we would... Um, delete the health and safety waiver rate off your rate table, right? Because obviously, if the rate study rate is going to be higher than your health and safety waiver rate, we want to go with the higher rate for you, right? Obviously. So, and we have to, of course, align it with the rate study. So, uh, Norma Vioretta is our health and safety waiver specialist. She will be reaching out to everybody to discuss this. We will do some internal assessment, but we will also be, of course, reaching out to vendors to let you guys know if. It's a situation in which we're going to be um, exhausting your health and safety waiver rate because the rate study, you know, rate is is applicable. And if it's not, we'll we'll discuss those next steps, right? So um, we have several folks with health and safety waivers, both agency health and safety waivers and um, client specific. So we will be in close contact regarding that. Um, if you have specific questions, you can reach out to Norma and myself, um, and. Michelle, would you mind putting Norma in my emails in the chat while I just continue to chat about this? Are you cool with that? So yeah, if you yeah. have specific questions, but just know this, this will be something you will be contacted by us to discuss it. So exemptions. The rate study developed rate models for most services individuals receive. Additionally, the rate study recommended reducing or eliminating the use of some service codes as these codes effectively duplicate services provided under other service codes. As part of the rate reform, existing service providers will transition to service codes and associated rates that align with the services actually provided. 
However, some providers delivery service, deliver services that do not align with services defined in statute, regulation, and or the directive issued as part of this rate reform. Often these, service, um, these services use one of the service codes listed in attachment A. Um, Michelle's gonna go over an attachment A in a moment. So if regional centers determine that a provider's service does not fit into any of the updated service descriptions, the regional center must request department approval to utilize one of these service codes listed in the top, um, the top table of attachment A. Requests for existing providers must be submitted using the form provided to the department by December 31st of this year. Right. So we're going to be rocking and rolling and, and getting these things done by December 31st of 2024. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. A link to an online form will be provided under separate cover to each regional center. Um, and uh, the existing service codes and rates may continue to be used while the department's decision is pending. And I know this is a lot, so take your time to digest this, right? Read this yourself as well. <laughs> so new vendorizations, effective January 1 of 2025, regional centers will use the rates found, right? And you can click here. There's a nice little click uh, for the January 2025 rates to establish rates for all new service providers of services included in the rate reform. This includes rates that previously were set by the department, such as community-based day programs, infant development programs, and in-home respite. Vendorizations for these services do not require department approval. Effective immediately for pending vendor applicants, service codes identified in the top table of attachment two can be used only if approved by the department. If a regional center determines that a prospective provider services do not align with any of the updated service descriptions, a request using the online form described in the exemption process section must be submitted to the department. Just so you guys know, we don't have access to that online form yet. We're pending that. So we'll share that with you as we get more. But um, also just a reminder, and I'll put this in the chat. If you have any general rate study questions for DDS, they have a rate studies question email. Um, so I'll put that in the chat. And we'll have uh, Michelle now share information about attachment A because that will kind of connect the dots. Thank you, Jordan. Sorry about that. Um, can you see the attachment? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if for some reason it doesn't work for you, I can pull it up on mine too. Okay. Is it sharing yet? It is now. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. So I did put our um, rate questions at alterregional.org as well in there for you guys. Um, so the attachment A is just once again what Jordan went through. Um, so starting January 1st, 2025, the continued use of and new vendorizations for services using the following service codes require department approval of an exemption using the online form. We do have some information on what will be requested on that form. However, we don't have the formal form and I'll share that with you. Um, so those service codes are 028, Socialization Training Program, the 048, Parent um, Support Behavior Intervention Training, our 055s, Community Integration Training Programs, 063s, community activity supports, 103s, our specialized health treatment and training services, and our 525 social rec program. So um, to to um, for any continued use and new vendorization for these service codes, we need to request an exemption for those. Um, it does say current providers may continue to use these service codes through the 2025 transition to new service codes and do not need to request an exemption. There's some conflicting information on that that we have reached out to the department to get some further clarification on that. We want to be safe uh, rather than sorry. So um, if I just wanted to kind of connect. So just to let you guys know on these service codes and the one that we've talked about this before, we um, John was meeting with DDS today. We have some follow up meetings next week with the department and we will be scheduling um, vendor forums and informational meetings with these service codes to answer all of your questions. So um, the next section of the um, attachment A is the starting uh, January 1st, 2025. The following service codes are transitioning to new codes and no longer can be used. So we no longer can vendor under them. They no longer can, um, we can't process those vendorizations. So current providers may continue to use these service codes through the 2025 transition to new service codes 
and do not need to request an exemption. Again, we're following up with some additional information on that. So these are the service codes here um, that will be going away. Um, it looks like our, our day programs, our 505, 510, and 515s will be transitioning to several different um, service codes. We have a day services, a behavioral service, and a medical service, um, and some other ones there that kind of break down that. Um, here's an example of what information will be requested um, will be requested regarding that exemption. So the date of the submission, the vendorization, the new vendorization, the name, the number, the proposed service code, some additional, the service address, and the reason for the request. Um, and it does say that, as Jordan covered as well, that you, as we process these, these service codes will be continue able to continue to be used as the department is making that decision. So um, we will make sure to share this with you guys. If you guys, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions, please send them to that inbox um, that we shared with you. And we'll make sure to connect uh, with John as well to share the um, those so we can address those moving forward. Sounds good. Um, go ahead, Andrea. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, coordinated family supports and coordinated career pathways because they're not in the rate study and we're vendorizing of that, but are they okay because they're like the pilot project with the rates themselves? Um, Does that make sense in my question? Or like what? <laughs> At this time, we have not received any further information that um, those are going to be impacted at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because mm -hmm. there are several uh, service codes that are not included in the rate study. We have several on kind of the specialized side with crisis and, you know, different programs like that are crisis intervention services like service code 017, right? So there are definitely some service codes that are not in the rate study. So we'll continue to share as we get more updates from DDS on that. Um. And for folks, um, we've got about two minutes left. So do, you know, really take an opportunity to read through that. I did put the directive in the chat, DDS, right? They have their whole webpage about the rate reform, stay informed, read the directives, make your questions. And two, right, like you can reach out to us with to questions with DDS. But if you review these docs and have questions, bring them on back to coffee, right? We'll, um, we do have an announcement that due um, in uh, honor of Veterans Day, right? The Veterans Day weekend next weekend, we are going to cancel Coffee with Community Services next Friday. So we won't be holding coffee. We'll, um, uh, John will arrange for us to send out a MailChimp notice to folks too, so that they know. But, uh, you know, just in, I know a lot of folks will be probably out of town for the three-day weekend, and we just wanted to give people an opportunity to to honor that Veterans Day holiday. Um, any questions for us before we, before we log off today? Jordan, I just wanted to note also, I reached out um, to request that a MailChimp be sent out with the bulletin for um, the provider directory, so you guys all have access to that. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll continue to have rate reform discussions here, uh, except for next Friday, but we'll continue to have them ongoing right through the rest of the year. So uh, have a great weekend all. Bye-bye.